Well, good morning. Good morning. I think I'm on. I can hear me a little bit. We're getting there. Good morning, good morning, good morning. All right, that's better. Yeah, okay. If you can make your way back to your seats, and as you're getting to your seats, if you can open in your Bible to Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29 is where we'll be at this morning. And once you're at Exodus 29, you can go ahead and find verse 46. Exodus 29, 46. And then if you will stand with me and we will read as a congregation together. All right. Exodus chapter 29, verse 46. If you don't have your Bible, it'll be on the screen behind me. And we'll read all together. I got light work for you this morning. One, two, three, read. This is the word of the Lord. God, we ask this morning as we enter into your word that we would be reminded of who you are and that we would be reminded of who we are in light of that. God, I confess that it's easy for us to go throughout our weeks thinking much of ourselves and thinking little of you. And it's easy for us to go throughout our weeks thinking much of our ability and little of yours. And so, God, we ask this morning that we would be confronted not with our own sufficiency, but with yours. Even in this moment, I recognize, God, that it is far more dependent upon your spirit than my words. It is far more dependent upon your spirit than our response. And so we ask, that your spirit would move in power this morning through the preaching of your word, through the words spoken and through the response to the words spoken. God, we ask for a work of God in our hearts today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we are back in Exodus, and it is so exciting for me because I love this book of the Bible. I loved a summer in the Gospel of Luke with you all, um, but I've missed this book, and uh, I kind of get the sense that we have missed this book. And so this book will be our text for the next few months of our church life, and I am looking forward to that. We've mentioned in the past that it seems as if the beginning of the book is the part of the book that's preached. And that's what we've covered so far. We've covered God's people getting moved out of slavery in Egypt. But what does it look like for God's people once they are no longer enslaved? What's the purpose of the rest of the book of Exodus? My goal today is not necessarily to focus in on one particular text, but to remind us of where we've been and cast a vision for where we will be going. To do that... um, I want to remind us of something that happened a few years ago. Uh, Do you guys remember in 2020 when the world lost their mind about toilet paper? Does everybody remember that? Yeah, I I specifically remember, and I, I think there was one news story about an actual fight in a grocery store in Australia, that, that, that there was a literal fight over toilet paper. A pandemic was raging. International and national turmoil was everywhere. And to make matters worse, there was a toilet paper shortage. People began to lose their minds. And it wasn't just toilet paper, but panic buying became a normative human experience for a season. Did you need extra canned goods in your house? You weren't sure, so you bought the store out of them. 
Did you need extra toilet paper? You weren't sure, so you bought as many rolls as you could find. Why? Why was the natural human response to unknown, to seek out preservation in menial things like toilet paper? And I, I'd like to pose this morning that the answer is comfort. Humans crave comfort. And that craving only goes up in moments of stress, in moments of unknown, in moments of anxiety. It's why the breakup binge shows up in TV shows, where a relationship has gone sour, and so I crawl into a comfy comforter and I eat Ben and Jerry's ice cream. It's why couches have gotten softer, yoga pants socially acceptable, life without air conditioning unimaginable, two-day shipping e incomprehensible. I'll pay the extra $2.99 to have it delivered between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. tonight. We crave comfort. We crave immediacy related to that comfort. We crave something that can provide us with some sort of help. And I don't think that's a bad thing. In fact, I think it's the way we've been designed. The world isn't supposed to be the way it is. We were created for a life of endless joy and endless peace in the presence of God in a world without brokenness. It makes sense, then, if that's what we've been created for, that when faced with brokenness, our natural response is to pursue comfort. We're all trying to answer, answer a question. Where do we go for lasting, sustaining comfort? Throughout church history, Christians have sought to answer this, and they've thought a lot about this idea of comfort, and here's one of the gifts they have given us in this conversation. They've given us a question, and that question goes like this, what is our only comfort in life and in death? When our eyes open to face a new day, we experience the first waking moments, feeling the breath in our lungs, what gives us comfort. When faced with pandemics and suffering and broken relationships and on the day when death, that ancient tyrant, knocks on our door, what gives us comfort? As we summarize where we've been and where we're going in the book of Exodus this morning, I'd like to argue that God, through the book of Exodus, wants to help us answer that question. Where do we go for comfort? Here's where we've been. Exodus 29, 46, the first half says this. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. The Exodus, it's this beautiful picture of what God has done to provide comfort to a people enslaved. What I want to do the next few minutes is just show the story of where we've been. We're going to cover the first 18 chapters in like 12 minutes is my goal. So we'll see how that goes. Exodus 1 and 2, it begins with God's people enslaved in Egypt. And the people of God's promise, these are the people that God from the beginning of the biblical story, God has promised to make a great nation out of them, to bless them. He promises that He will be their God and they will be His people and that their particular nation will be a blessing to the world. And here we show up in Exodus chapter 1 after all those promises have been made and instead they are enslaved. Not necessarily a blessing to the world, but instead being oppressed by the world. Being taken advantage of by the nation of Egypt. And the most striking part about Exodus chapter 1 is the first 14 verses have nothing to say about God. He's missing from the picture, it would seem. He isn't mentioned anywhere in those first 14 verses, but instead what we see is that the people of God's promise, they're not building up God's kingdom, they're trapped in Egypt under the impression of, oppression of a wicked king who's forcing them to build up his kingdom. But what we'll see as we continue on in that book, in this book, is that God 
multiplies his people. He's still fulfilling his promises to multiply them. And then out throughout that story, he's raising up unlikely deliverers to save his people. Not because of anything in them, not because of, who, of what they have done, but because of who he is. What we learn in the very first verses of the book of Exodus is that God is a faithful God to his promises. And that he is committed to his people. And that's where chapters 3 to 6 take us. To God's continued promise to bring his people out of slavery. See, while God was unknown in the beginning of chapter 1, in chapter 3 he makes himself known by encountering Moses at the burning bush. He introduces himself as the God of Israel's ancestors. But when asked for greater clarity into identity, he says, I am who I am. Or, I will be what I will be. In other words, do you want to know who God is? That's what Exodus is after, to introduce us to a God. But the way that we know who this God is, is not by our own subjective interpretation. It's by what He reveals about Himself by watching Him in the world as He works. And what you'll know very quickly throughout the book of Exodus is as you watch this God, He is true to His promises. See, we have, a, we have an entirely different story if God can't get His people out of Egypt. I want us to think about that. If God shows up and He says, hey, I promise I'm going to get you out of Egypt, and then He fails at that, we don't have God anymore. <laughs> and all of us showed up to church here for a really weird social club. If God doesn't get his people out, he is not God. Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt would have just as much claim to that position. But God gets his people out, and there's this driving motive behind his action in the world throughout the first half of the book. And the driving motive shows up in our text today. They will know that I am the Lord their God. You see, the, the motive of God is so that he will be known. And relationship with God always starts with the knowledge that he is God. I cannot claim to have a relationship with God if the verdict is still out on whether or not he's God or someone else is. He's the only God. That's the motive for God's action throughout the rest of this book. That's the motive of God's action throughout history so that we would know that he is God and we are not. That he is God and that no one else is. It's this divine motive to, to proclaim himself as the ruler of all things, the ruler of all creation, and his actions in the book of Exodus are not because his people are particularly awesome. In fact, what we'll see throughout the beginning half of the book and the rest of the book is they continually doubt him. And you and I say, oh man, yes and amen, because I have those moments. But God continues to act. He continues to act and he continues to work so that we would be without a doubt that He is God and we are not. And that's what He does throughout the beginning of this book. He continues to act so that His people and so that Egypt and so that the nations and so that you and I today will know that He is God. I want us to think about that great news for just a brief moment. God wants us to know Him. I want you to think about that. We are not limited to our subjective understanding of the world. But we are gifted revelation from God Himself. And this is the story throughout Exodus and the story throughout the Bible that God Himself descends to meet with His people. In Exodus 3, He descended to meet with Moses at the mountain he descends to meet with humanity in Christ. And He descends today by the power of the Spirit to dwell with us even now. And one day, heaven will descend to earth and sin will be no more and suffering will be no more and brokenness will be no more. And we will feast in endless joy with our Savior who makes Himself known. God is a God who reveals Himself. 
who descends to meet with his people. And that's a comfort, my friends. That's a comfort in life and in death, that the God of the universe, he meets with us, that the God of the universe acts so that we might know him, so that you might have confidence in who he is. It's not in my notes, but it's just this, just this thought that's been running through my head. I've been discussing the gospel with a lot of people that aren't Christians lately. And it's been happening quite frequently, and there's this continued refrain. How can we know anything? They continue to, this is an issue that continues to come up. I don't know, I just don't think we can know who God is. And I would like to posit to all of us today that you can, because God has descended to meet with his people You do not have to live in doubt about who this God is. He has gifted us His Word. He has gifted us His person. He has gifted us His Spirit. And He wants you to know Him and to have confidence in who He is. And that's where the story moves. It moves to a knowledge of God, not just as some divine being out there somewhere. You see, the early readers of this text they would not have thought to themselves, well, you said God and now I know who you are. No, there was a plurality of gods that were worshipped at that time. And so for God to come on the scene and say something like, I am God, they would have said, which one? Which one of the gods? And God says, I am who I am. I'm not any of the gods that you worship. I'm the God. And this is where chapters 7 through 11 goes. It's where the story moves. God is the only God. You see, the most important thing for God's people to know, the most important thing for the Egyptians to know, and the most important thing for us to know today is that God is God. (laughs) I know that sounds silly, but it's true that God is God. And that's what's happening in Exodus 7 through 11. It's a bit far from us, but each one of those plagues is God showing that the gods of the Egyptians are not, like, they're not gods to be worshipped. They're really just play things carved in images by human hands. You see, the plagues through 7 through 11, they weren't cruel or arbitrary. Each one was directed towards a false god of that day. And those gods were looked to as providers, and God is showing that it's Him who's in control. He's the one who gives all things, not the false gods of the Egyptians. And what's incredible about that section of Scripture, verses chapter 7 through 11, is that many Egyptians see God on display, and they hightail it out of Egypt with God's people. They leave Egypt to go be a part of God's people. See, God's work in the world, it has a missional component to it. It's so that we would know Him and be in relationship with Him, that He would be God and we would be His people. It's so that he will be known. And that's exactly what happens. He takes his people out of Egypt, including many Egyptians who now have become his people. And through the Passover, where the blood of the Lamb covers the people of God and rains judgment on all who have rejected him, and he takes his people out of Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea unscathed, But those who have rejected Him are swallowed up in the waters of God's judgment. You see, you will either know God as your Savior and Redeemer, or you will know God as judge. There's only two ways to know Him. As Savior and Redeemer, or as judge. And so God's people are taken out of Egypt because the God above all fought for them. And he gets them out of slavery in Egypt. And Hollywood says, roll the credits. What a story. But that's not the end of the story. In fact, it's only a fraction of it. Because what happens next is God's people are led by God to the wilderness. And what happens very, very quickly is they start to say, I think it was better in Egypt. (laughs) I think it was better when we were under harsh slavery and oppression. 
You see, Egypt wasn't the problem. Brokenness in them still exists. And God leads them into the wilderness to reveal to God's people that it wasn't enough to get them out of Egypt. The rejection of God wasn't an Egypt problem. It's a human problem. In the wilderness, it shines a light on the desperate need of humanity to not just experience circumstantial deliverance, but that we need a greater deliverance. I want us to think about that concept of shining a light. I, um, I don't do much plumbing work because it ends up costing me more than if I were to call someone in the first place. And you can judge me. I'm fine. Uh, I know my limitations. So... Um, a couple weeks ago, there was a leak, and I could not figure out where the leak was coming from. So I opened the, the cabinet, uh, it was un- under the kitchen, I opened the, the cabinets to the kitchen sink, and I looked underneath, and I couldn't see what the problem was. I know there's a leak, there's water everywhere, but I have no idea what's com- wh- where it's coming from. So what do I do? I shine a light so I can see the problem. I know that's a simple illustration. But I think it's important for us to recognize something. At times, God will bring his people into the wilderness because it shines a light on the true problem. It shines a light on the true problem. You see, I think that we would like for the Lord to just give us what we want and never actually engage with us in a way that helps us to see what our true need is. But God uses the wilderness in the lives of his people to show them a few things. He uses the wilderness to show them that the problem is deeper than slavery in Egypt. The problem goes down to their very nature. They need a greater deliverance than circumstance. They need a greater hero than Moses. There's two stories in Exodus 15 through 18 that stick out like a sore thumb. One of those stories is where Moses is raising up a staff as the people go to war against the Amalekites, and he cannot hold the staff up on his own. And do you know what that's there to tell us? It's not there to tell us the man of God needs help. So we've got to surround him and make sure he has all the help that he needs. It's there to tell us that Moses is insufficient. Moses isn't the deliverer God's people need. And then chapter 18 shows up, and it's this obscure story about the fact that Moses is burning the people out by taking all of their requests. He would sit down, and everyone would come to him throughout the day, and they would start to tell him their needs, and he would mediate the problems of the people of God all day long. And his father-in-law shows up, and he's like, you're an idiot. Like, what are you doing? This is not good for you, and this is not good for the people. You need to, you need help. And the purpose of that story is not to say, here's the leadership structure that the church should operate on. The purpose of that story is to help us to see the people needed a greater deliverer and a greater mediator and a greater lawgiver than Moses. He was not enough. He may have gotten them out of Egypt, but he was not their savior. And that's good news for us, my friends. Because those stories exist to tell us that there is a Savior. And He is a man. And He is someone we can look to to mediate God's Word perfectly. And He is someone who will have His arms raised up and nailed to the cross as He defeats our greatest enemy. See, the wilderness, it shines a light on the people's need. They need a better leader. They need a better deliverance. And brothers and sisters, that's true for us. We need a better leader. We need a better deliverance. And that's where Exodus 29, 46 come, comes in. This is part two of that. This is the reason why he brings them out, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. I want us to remember that God's vision for the life of His people is never just to remove them from circumstance. I actually think this is a, a pretty big issue in our lives today. 
we want God to show up to do what we want him to do for us. But we buck against his authority and his wisdom for our lives. <laughs> Look, God, I've got a problem. I just want you to come deal with the problem, but then I kind of want to do my own thing, create my own nation, do, do my own stuff. I want God to provide for me financially, but I don't want him to have a say over my money. <laughs> I want God to keep me healthy, but I don't want him to have a say over how I live my life. I want God to fix broken things, but I don't want to listen to his care instructions. It's, it's like a doctor who just saved you from a heart attack telling you, please stop eating fatty foods. And you saying, sounds good. I'm going to have steak quesadillas for every meal this week. It's like, man, I'm sure you're having a great time, but you'll be back pretty quickly. Here's what Exodus is going to show us for the rest of this book. It's going to show us that the greatest need for the Israelites, it's not freedom from slavery in Egypt to then be free to slavery to self. That's not the greatest need for them. No, it's freedom from slavery, yes, but freedom to God. Freedom to God. Hear that? Freedom to God. To worship God in a way that is right and healthy. See, the Exodus is a challenging picture of what we must do. The book of Exodus, it's at the heart of Christian discipleship. And let me explain by what I mean when I say discipleship. Um, at the heart of discipleship is not, I do whatever I want. But discipleship is actually coming under someone's discipline. That's the root word coming under someone's discipline. And that's actually the beautiful reality of being part of the children of God, as we just sang a moment ago. It's that when God comes to us in correction, it's no longer in punishment, but in discipline, like a loving father to a child. It's a father who comes to his son trying to stick a fork in a light socket and says to him, don't do that. You see, an unloving father would be like, go for it, let's see what happens. Sucks to be you. That would be an unloving father. But a loving father comes and he says, let's not do that. Let's remove ourselves from the pain of that. Let me tell you why that does not work for your life. That's the, that's the freedom. Is that as we have been brought out of slavery... We're brought into the discipline of the Lord. And the testimony of the Bible is that to be in the discipline of the Lord is the best place to be. Not just to be uh, under the rod, but also to be under His loving care. This is Psalm 23 for us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Your rod and your staff which are operating tools for the shepherd to keep his sheep close to him. They comfort us. Do we hear that language again of comfort? See, God knows that the best place for his people to be, the comforting place for his people to be, is not in freedom to whatever we want, but freedom to be with him and under his discipline. And so at the heart of the di Christian discipleship, it's not, I'm free to do whatever I want. You see, Israel was set free from one man master in order that they might serve a new one, and that's our story. We have been freed from slavery to sin so that we might serve God. And that's the rest of this book. What does it look like to live in right relationship to God after deliverance? What does it look like? It's where the book will go. God did not deliver them to make gods in their own image or to worship their own wisdom. He delivered them so that He might bring them into right relationship with Him. And only in right relationship with God is there comfort in life and in death. This is what I, I posited at the beginning of this sermon, that Exodus exists to answer the question, what brings comfort in life and in death? That we are not our own but that we belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. 
the Israelites were not their own, but they belonged to God. And the more we understand that reality, that we are not our own, but that we belong to God, the more comfort we have in life and in death. You see, this Jesus Christ, He has fully paid for all of our sins with His precious blood. He has set us free from the tyranny of the devil. And He watches over us in such a way that not a hair can fall from our head without the will of our Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together in order for our salvation because we belong to Christ. And by His Holy Spirit, He will assure us of eternal life. And He will make us wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him as those who belong to Him. This is the only place we can go for comfort. Freedom from and freedom to. It's a recognition that we don't belong to ourselves, but that we belong in life and in death to God. If I belong to God in life, then who owns my day? No matter what happens, He owns my day. And if I belong to God in death, then does death have the final say over me? No. Because I don't belong to death. God does. If I belong to God in life and death, then does sin have the final say over my life? No. Because I don't belong to sin. I belong to God. He bought me with a price on that cross. He redeemed me and paid the price for all my sins. In closing, I want us to go to Romans 6. I want to spend a couple minutes there to remind us of some things. Romans chapter 6, verse 15 through 18. Let me read it for us. What then are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace. So this is, this is the, the logic of Paul at this point in time. He has just spent most of the book of Romans saying, it's not the law that saves you. It is Christ and grace alone that saves you. And the natural human response is, great, I can do whatever I want now, right? And Paul says, no. <laughs> no, that would be submitting yourself to slavery again, but the wrong kind of slavery. So you're not freed from something in order to be enslaved to yourself. You are freed from slavery and as he will go on to say, to be a slave to righteousness. Let's keep reading. By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? So the logic goes, um, it's not that some people are free and some people are slaves. It's that we're all enslaved to something. And you want to know what you're enslaved to? Look at what you walk in obedience to. That's, how, that's what you want to know, what you're enslaved to. Okay, keep going. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. No longer owned by our sin, but now owned by God. Do you see the turn? It's no longer slavery to sin. You no, you no longer enslaved to death and to destruction and to brokenness. You have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, and now you are no longer a slave to your sin and a slave to yourself. You are now a slave to life, even in death. That's the good news of the Gospel, that God gets us out of slavery not so that we can go be enslaved to ourselves, but so that we can walk in right relationship to Him and right relationship to others through being longing to Him alone. My friends, you belong to God. You belong to God. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And as we go in the book of Exodus, 
we are invited to learn what it looks like to live into the redemption that's been made available to us. A redemption that's freedom from slavery to death and freedom to life in Christ. We belong to God. We belong to God. So what do we need to know and what will Exodus work to teach us throughout the rest of this book in order to live in the joy of this comfort? Three things. One, we need to know how great our sin and misery is. It is not, well, if I had enough time, I'd spend more time with the Lord. It is not, if, well, if circumstances worked out in my favor, then I would be able to show kindness to those around me. But people were real jerks to me today, so I got to be a real jerk back. That's, that's not the way that this works. We need to know how great it is. It goes so much deeper than circumstantial deliverance. It goes all the way down to our very core of our being. And God shines a light on that for us in the book of Exodus. That the problem is not circumstance. The problem is nature and self. And we need to know how great that sin is and how great that misery is. But if we stop there, we will misstep We need to know that we've been set free from those sins and that misery. We need to know that thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, He has given us the victory over sin and death. We need to know that we can sing, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? And third, we need to know how to live in light of that deliverance. And that's what we get to learn throughout the book of Exodus. What it looks like to live in light of the redemption that's been bought for us. So don't miss church for like the next four months, is what I'm saying. I'm not joking, but I'm glad you laughed. So let's pray. God, we ask this morning as we are stepping back into this magnificent book, this book of the Bible that shows us the price of our redemption, that shows us the Father's plan unfolding and invites us to see and to know who you are and what you've done. We thank you for it. We thank you for your bloodshed. We pray that as we continue in this series that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are God that you have delivered us and that we are invited into life in your name. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.